Sorry about this, just uh, new to Zoom. <laughs> okay, now, um, what I'm going to talk to you today about uh, is, uh, you know, Banda, Banda Island, what happened to Banda Island about 400 years ago. Today is 8th of May, is a very important anniversary for the people of the Banda Island, for people of Indonesia, and especially people of, uh, of Holland, you know, what we call Holland, the Dutch Republic. Um, there is a link with America as well. And that's why many people, especially from New York, are interested in the story of what happened to Banda, you know, 400 years ago. Um, you will see what I mean as I, as I go through my presentation. Um, the picture that you can see, um, can everybody see this? Can you just wave or let me know if you can see? Okay. <clears throat> The image that you can see, I brought together some uh, pictures and, and a, a artist de depiction of what happened uh, on 20, sorry, 8th of May, um, 1621. Now the stru structure of today's presentation is this. I will show you a short video. Uh, then I will talk about how I got interested uh, in the topic. Um, and then I will talk about the, you know, the context, the Anglo-Dutch uh, spice wars, the context of the of what happened to the Banda Islands, um, and uh, I will also say a little bit about the story of uh, Bengali slavery. You know why I got interested in the project. So what I will do now, I will show you the video.
Hope you enjoyed uh, watching this uh, video. Uh, so I will go through my presentation now and we can have a discussion at the end. Um, as I was saying earlier, you know, um, today marks the 400 years anniversary of the start of the process of what they called Banda genocide. It started with a massacre of uh, 44 top uh, leaders of uh, the communities in, in those islands. Um, and it was all because of uh, this little beautiful looking fruit, which produced uh, some spices that people loved all over the world, especially in Europe, it was very expensive. And the scientific name is Miristica fragrance, but it's known as uh, nutmeg. Can you see the screen now, <coughs> PowerPoint presentation? All right. Now, my interest in this uh, started um, about 10 years ago, um, although I haven't spent uh, much time researching on the topic. Uh, about 10 years ago, I was studying, uh, trying to understand the Portuguese history and historical links with Bengal. While I was looking for materials on um, you know, the Portuguese in Bengal, I came across a piece of uh, writing by a lady. Um, her name is Will O. Digic. Yeah, about, uh, about 10 years ago, I became interested in um, you know, learning about the Portuguese uh, history, Portuguese links with Bengal's history. And while I was researching, I found an article uh, called An End to the History of Silence. Uh, it was written by someone called Will O. Digic. Uh, subsequently, I bought another book uh, written by her to get some more information, uh, background about her and also about her research. Um, and I was really amazed because I had no idea before that Dutch were involved in taking, you know, Bengalis as slaves, uh, buying mainly from Arakan um, and, and taking them to, you know, first to what is called Jakarta present day and then distributing them to their expanding settlements and empires around the Indonesian archipelago. I also read another book by someone called uh, Stephen Egbert uh, Gellin. And in there, there are lots of details about how the uh, Portuguese and the Arakanese used to capture uh, slaves you know, on the from the coastal areas of uh, Southern Bengal and then bring them to the slave market in Arakan and how the Dutch started to buy slaves from 1624 from uh, Arakan Bengali slaves. Information from uh, the, the, the article and then to the history of silence, uh, what she talked about is that the first shipment of uh, slaves, you know, from the Bay of Bengal started in 1621. And she mentions the massacre, you know, of Pabanda. And this was the first time I heard about the Banda massacre. She said that this was also the year in which Dutch and which the Dutch under the commander of Jan Peterson Cohen murdered practically the entire population of the Banda Islands. Now she didn't specifically say that Bengali slaves were taken to the Banda Island, but the impression that I got is that the slaves that they were taken from Arakan, Bengali slaves, to first to Jakarta and then distributed and somewhere uh, ended up in, in the Banda. But I've seen no piece of writing which says that Bengali slaves were actually shipped to Banda. Uh, but majority of the writing that I've seen on slavery in the Indonesian archipelago, they talk about, uh, or they suggest or imply, or, or um, gives the impression that Bengali slaves were taken to, to the Banda Island. Uh, but this particular lady, she provides um, uh, details, you know, of um, the first shipment of uh, Bengali slaves and she names the ships and how many uh, were taken. Um, and then she also provides uh, details, the numbers. These are official numbers, but unofficially, others were also taken unofficially. And these are official numbers she provides. It's not a big number uh, compared to you know, the transatlantic slavery, but Dutch were also taking slaves from South India, you know, from Pulikat. Um, so there's separate list for the Pulikat numbers. 
see, this led me to develop an interest in the conflict, you know, that the English and the Dutch got engaged in. Um, now, I, I, I'm talking about 25 years, right? Uh, it's because uh, it's not exactly 25 years. Um, it's, uh, it's around, around that many. I know the kind of spice wars ended with the Ambon massacre, you know, in 1623 when, um, when about 10 Englishmen were tortured and killed by the Dutch. Uh, and that was kind of the beginning of, well, the end of English presence, you know, kind of in the Indonesian archipelago. But they were that time concentrating and focusing their um, in energy in the North Indian uh, subcontinent. Um, on the west, sorry, northwestern India. Now, if you look at the map uh, that I have provided, um, now the Europeans, you know, they were buying spices from all over Asia, from Sri Lanka, from you know Java, Sumatra, um, India, other places. But the word spice islands, as far as I can see, refers to this uh, small area. Is in present day. Uh, North Maluku, you know, province of Maluku in Indonesia, uh, mainly consists of uh, you know those two tiny, few tiny islands at the top of this uh, area that I have um, enclosed, and the Banda Islands. Uh, there were some in Ambon, uh, but you can see Banda Islands are very tiny compared to some of the other islands, and it was only in the Banda Island that nutmeg grew, um, and it's very kind of difficult to get to. And from the bit of the map at the top, you can see where the Banda Island is situated. So this is, um, you know, you can see Indonesia, the whole of Indonesia and Java. And so Banda Island is quite remote. It took me about three hours or so to fly from Jakarta to Ambon and then take a 22 hour ship ride to, to Banda Naira, the administrative island of the Banda archipelago. And um, they are very kind of beautiful, but it can be you know, quite isolated and, and lonely, you know, if you're used to bigger places and used to traveling. Um, but the people of uh, Banda Island, they had historical connection with uh, places all over, especially the area. Arabs, uh, Indians also used to end up um, there to buy spices and bring in other supplies and Javanese and others were also trading. Then the first Europeans to arrive were the Portuguese in, 16, in 1512, I think. Now, this one, I just wanted to show you with this one, um, a table just to give you an indication of the number of ships, you know, the Dutch sent and the um, English sent. Now, these are not all the ships that they sent to, you know, the, the, in, the, in the East, in, in the Indian Ocean. These are only the number of ships that was, they ended up in the Banda Island. Uh, so the number of ships that both the Dutch and the English sent were much higher number. But the English uh, number was really small compared to the Dutch. If you look at the left, uh, left side, um, you know, during um, the first 20 years or so, the Dutch sent more than 80 ships into Banda alone, and where the English only managed about uh, 13. Uh, so the English, uh, you know, uh, they, at the beginning, they were not able to send um, or organize, um, you know, their, their, their East uh, uh, India Company venture as well as the Dutch. But also the Dutch had a more strategic aim and they really went to achieve their strategic aim. Um, they wanted to capture, you know, and control uh, through violence. But in the early period, English were not doing that. They were trying to secure trade um, and establish you know, like a trading links. So there were a very big difference between the way the English and the Dutch were operating in the early years. This is just to give an example of, um, you know, where the English uh, ships uh, were sent, you know, what they were trying to do. 
um, I mean, you can see they were uh, going all over the places. If you look at a equivalent table for the Dutch, they also went to places and probably many more places than the English went. So they were trying to you know, seek out uh, trade um, and opportunities in, in, in that part of the world. Now I will talk about how the conquest of Banda Islands took place. If you look at this map, you can see uh, Island Rune, which is about 10 miles from the Naira Island. You know, but Naira is the administrative capital. One of the reason is because uh, here in Naira, they have very deep port uh, so that big ships can come and anchor. Um, whereas, um, it's not possible in, in any of the other places. This is probably why this Nera became the, like a capital or administrative um, part of the island. Now, um, over a peri period of uh, 12 years, um, you know, four of the islands were like uh, violently kind of conquered you know, by the Dutch. Um, Api, there was hardly any people living there and this was a volcanic mountain and occasionally, um, you know, uh, erupted and, and caused a lot of damage in, in surrounding places. So not many people lived and nutmeg didn't grow, but nutmeg grew in all those other islands, you know, especially in Banda Basar, um, full of nutmegs. about the conquest of uh, Nera. Um, in 16, um, sorry, yeah, 1609, uh, Admiral Firehoven arrived you know, with 14 ships and he was um, given commission you know, uh, to basically take over the island, you know, uh, the Nutmeg Island by either force or by treaty. Um, at that time, an English uh, captain from the East India Company's third voyage was already there, uh, but he was the only with one ship uh, with not many people. Um, the English were not sending you know, enough uh, resources into that part of the world, but some English uh, people, commanders, they did argue for a stronger presence you know, in, the, uh, in the Nutmeg Island, in the Spice Island, uh, but the Dutch got there and then through in a treaty, an agreement that they forced the locals to um, to engage with, uh, sorry, to to um, contract with the Dutch, uh, and they tried to prevent others from accessing, you know, the the nutmegs and cloves from uh, those islands. But William Killing, he what he did, he tried to actually get some um, islanders to sign contract, you know, to give uh, some of the islands away to the English crown. King James, but he was not uh, able to achieve that. Dutch managed to get him, force him out of the area, uh, although he got some uh, spices, you know, before he managed to get there. What uh, the new uh, Dutch captain did, he landed troops and tried to, started to build a fort. You can see the um, building here, the wall. Um, this became known as Fort Nassau. I mean, he didn't ask for permission. He did try to get agreement from um, the leaders of another island to allow them to build a fort, but they were not uh, willing or they were um, kind of suspicious of uh, Dutch, what they wanted to do. But then the Dutch decided to um, start anyway. So they landed you know, in the small island, Naira, and they started to build uh, this fort, Fort Nassau. Um, now, the local people kind of objected, they tried to create problems, but the Dutch were there in strong force. Uh, what followed is uh, in the mainly from the Dutch sources, and we don't have any account of uh, local people, you know, what they did or what they thought. Uh, so we have no way of challenging, you know, with, you know, the truth or how much of what the Dutch have told us uh, to be kind of accurate or how, how much we should believe them uh, and so on. Um, so what happened while they were try building the fort, um, you know, they received communication from uh, the island's uh, leaders 
that they want to negotiate. Um, so the, if they could come to a place uh, mentioned, you know, where they should come for negotiation. So Dutch commander, you know, he went with um, mostly um, non-armed forces um, because they, the local requested that they come uh, with, without soldiers. And the Dutch commander went, and then um, they got into an ambush, according to the Dutch. And the commander was killed, um, and about 30 others, other people were uh, on, on the Dutch side were killed. Um, and so next day, the Dutch, they selected a new leader, and then they went on the rampage, burning you know, villages and, and killing people and, and so on. And then at the end, they uh, got the or the leaders of the community to come to an agreement you know, with the Dutch. And included in the agreement was that all incoming ships and boats must anchor off the Dutch fort and submit to inspection, that no one could settle in Naira without the Dutch permit. Now the Dutch treated this conquest as a just conquest because they feel that they were attacked first, you know, their people were killed first. Uh, but then, you know, there's no, native people uh, to make a counterclaim, say that you started to build a force with force, you know, without our consent. But that's not important because native people didn't matter and then they are dead. They, were, they, they died a long time ago. The next uh, conquest was Pulau Ai. Um, Pulau Ai was probably five, six miles from uh, uh, Naira, right? Um, a new uh, general arrived in April 1651 with 11 ships. His instruction included, acquire unchallengeable control of the Spice Island, and he need not be overly nice about his methods. Now he demanded that all the islanders, you know, deliver all the spices to the Dutch alone. And then he decided to take I by force. He was planning to subdue um, all the all the islands uh, in in the area, um, you know, and establish full control. Now he ordered an invasion of Pulau Ai on 14th May, 1615. Uh, but it was a disaster for the Dutch. Although the Dutch managed to kind of uh, nearly take over the island, but according to the Dutch sources, at night, you know, the Dutch soldiers they lost their guard and drank and then um, the locals came and attacked them and they had to retreat and it was a real humiliation from, for the Dutch. Now the General Rhines, who uh, was in charge of, uh, he didn't lead the attack, right? But he was in charge of the mission in that part of the world. And he later died, you know, in, in Java, a very kind of humiliated. Um, but next year, you had Admiral Darkson Tilem was dispatched you know, with a strong force of 12 ships and more than 1,000 soldiers to sort out Pulau Ai. So he, he arrived in the Bandas in 1616 and a bizarre incident took place. Now, when he was uh, you know, moving his ship towards uh, Pulau Ai to take over, an English fleet arrived. Uh, under Captain Samuel Castleton. He had a total of um, five ships. So he placed his five ships in between the Dutch forces ships and Pulau Ai. Uh, and there was no way that without the big fight and win that the Dutch could uh, get to Pulau Ai. But uh, suddenly um, Captain Samuel Castleton realized that <coughs> the Dutch commander Tilem, you know, Daxen Tilem, was someone who actually saved his life a few years back in, in the Atlantic, you know, when the Portuguese nearly killed him. So he decided he couldn't fight the captain who saved his life. So he, <clears throat> he met the captain and he agreed to withdraw and kind of leave the island to the Dutch to conquer. At that time, there were some English people in Pulau Ai as well. So he just managed to get assurance that the English will not be hurt. Um, and then when Samuel Castleton left, the Dutch went and invaded and basically took over the island, but there was fierce fighting. 
Uh, what I've noticed is that although this, um, you know, the islands uh, are small and the population were few, but uh, the islanders um, fought fiercely, you know, tried to defend their island. Um, and, and they were skilled uh, in fighting. Uh, and then General uh, Admiral Chen Duxon uh, Tillem um, got uh, Orangkayas. Orangkayas are like uh, leaders of the communities uh, to sign uh, another contract. So what the Dutch tried to do, Dutch tried to get control of the island through getting, you know, leaders of the local community to sign European style contract, which they probably didn't understand, and then hold them to the contract and then punish them if they uh, violated the contract. What the Dutch also did, you know, when they conquered Pulau Ai, because a lot of people from Pulau Ai, they tried to escape, you know, to Pulau Run and many got drowned. The sea in that part of the world is very rough. Um, and, um, and then they also brought in uh, some people, <coughs> some slaves that they took from an island near Philippines, you know, which was previously controlled by the Spanish. And they brought them to Naira to work on the nutmeg plantations. Um, and they, but they were not good at it because they didn't <coughs> know how to take care of um, the, 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 the nutmeg tree and, and how to process the fruits, you know, when to pick and so on. Uh, but then they were manpower the Dutch needed, so they brought them to I as well to work on the um, depopulated uh, kind of island. The next island that the Dutch uh, conquered was uh, Pula Run. <coughs> now, in 1616, the English East India Company captain Nathaniel Courthope uh, arrived, you know, in Pula Run with two ships, Swan and Defend. Now, he was sent by um, John Jordan, you know, who was kind of the leader of the English in, 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 the, in the East Indies, you know, and, and a place um, to kind of uh, take an, the last island that was left, um, um, you know, uh, not under the direct control of the Dutch. Um, I mean, Dutch didn't have full control of all the other islands either, but they had agreements, you know, with with treaties with various leaders of various sections of um, of the island. I just want to point out one thing, which I should have done before, is that you know this they have they had a peculiar system um, in that part of uh, in, in those islands. There was no central political authority like a central sultan. In most of the other places uh, nearby, you know, bigger lands, they had sultans you know, who ruled. Um, in the Banda Islands, um, there was no central ruler. Um, you know, even in the island of Banda Basar, they had uh, like village leaders, right? There was no central. Uh, so, it, so nobody could sign agreement for everybody else, but, but the Dutch didn't uh, treat it like that. You know, when some people signed an agreement, they thought that they can bring every other uh, part of those islands under their control. Um, Uh, so when Nathaniel Kortov arrived in um, Ban Banda, he was specifically ordered by uh, John Jordan in Bantam, he was in Java that time, to you know, first find out you know, whether they had made any agreement with the Dutch. If not, then get them to sign an agreement. But when he got there, some of the leaders of Pulau Ai was also in exile you know, in Pulau Run after the Dutch took over. So Nathaniel Korto managed to get uh, some of the leaders of Pularun and Pulau Ai to sign an agreement, giving those islands to King James. Um, and then they become under King James's and English protection. Theoretically, they had both, but physically, in practice, they only had one rune. As soon as uh, Nathaniel Korto arrived, the Dutch tried to challenge him, you know, they came, uh, but then the English uh, quickly established strong, um, you know, fortified positions with guns. And, uh, and it was because only on one side, uh, you could have, you know, ships coming near the land and, 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 but all around the island, it was really impossible for ships to kind of anchor and move into the land. Uh, so the defense that Nathaniel Court established 
was strong enough to prevent the Dutch from uh, trying to invade. Um, in October uh, 1620, the English captain was killed at night when he was returning from his secret trip to Bandabasar. Now he heard that some of the leaders were interested in signing agreement with the English um, because they, they, they don't like the Dutch and they were really afraid or, you know, were in rebellion. Um, so he went um, to try and get some of the uh, leaders to sign a similar contract that he got from leaders of uh, Rune, you know, where he was establishing. Um, but then what happened on the way back, he was killed at night um, in the middle of the sea. Uh, and the news got to uh, Rune a week later and everybody became really demoralized. Uh, they did elect a new leader, but there was no spirit. And the English were in this island for about nearly four years. And it was really bad because uh, they didn't have enough food. The two ships that they brought with them, it didn't have enough supplies because they couldn't get enough supplies from Makassar, which they first you know, tried to um, stop en route to Banda. Um, and then later on, uh, both of the ships were mysteriously um, kind of, um, well, one of them was taken uh, you know, by force uh, by the Dutch, you know, uh, during a battle, and the other one mysteriously disappeared and ended up in the Dutch, uh, in Dutch hand. Uh, so for nearly four years, English, uh, and, and th this island also don't have any fresh water. So they usually collect rainwater to drink. And additional English people meant that, um, you know, the water that they used to save wasn't kind of enough. Uh, so they were kind of uh, starving and not enough food and water was a problem. So anyway, so the um, English got totally demoralized. Um, and then um, soon a Dutch sent a strong force to Rune and basically got, um, you know, all the English asset destroyed the guns thrown into the sea or, um, you know, uh, lower part of the island from uh, the hills. Um, and then allowed the English to stay in a tiny piece of island called um, Nileka. Uh, you can see in the map, it's so tiny. No one can survive there, you know, there's hardly any trees and so on. But gradually the English kind of slipped away from, uh, from all the places in, in the Bandas. Now I'm going to talk about the conquest of uh, the biggest island, you know, the uh, Banda Basar, uh, the um, kind of um, the banana-shaped uh, island. Um, the man Peter Jan Peterson Cohen, um, he arrived in the Bandas in late February, you know, in 1621. Now he is the man that has become uh, the main, um, the main kind of person, you know, um, Dutch personnel in the history of uh, what happened to Banda. And everybody Banda in Banda, they know about him. He's the one who, you know, um, organized and executed the plan, you know, to, uh, to organize, um, to carry out the genocide of the people. Um, he, he actually had been with um, um, early in when Weyerhoven was uh, killed in 1609, he was part of that group, but he managed to survive. So he probably had um, some instinct for revenge as well. Um, now, he was made um, governor general, you know, at a very young age, I think he was 31, um, in 1620, sorry, 18. And then he took uh, steps, which, um, which kind of, um, uh, you know, um, led to an end game with the English. He defeated the English in Jakarta. He defeated uh, English fleet, you know, um, and he burned Jakarta. He created Jakarta named the Batavia as the new capital. And uh, then in 1621, you know, he arrived in Banda with a very large force. And this time he was going to take, and now there was no English, uh, potential English threats either. Um, the three main English people in that part of the world who 
could have posed a threat. They were all eliminated or one of them died um, after making um, in a blunder. Um, so there were no rival to challenge. English assets were very low. Uh, the Dutch were triumphant because they already killed John Jordan and um, got uh, um, Daly, you know, uh, an English commander who came with a big, large force to defeat the Dutch, uh, but he couldn't achieve his goal. So then he died. He went to India and he died. Uh, so, and, and Cohen, if you look at Cohen's, uh, Cohen's writings, you know, his uh, messages, you know, his letters, you know, to the, the leaders of the Dutch East India Company in Holland, you will see Cohen had a very clear, um, you know, uh, strategic perspective on how to um, bring, you know, maximum profit for the company and what needs to be done. And what he was clear about is that in the Indies, you cannot really have um, um, competition, you know, uh, in having to access uh, spice. Now, nutmeg and cloves could be monopolized, but pepper couldn't because pepper grew in, you know, uh, like Sumatra and Java and also in the Malabar coast of India. Uh, and, and those places also had strong rulers, you know, but in those small islands, um, you know, where cloves grew and, and nutmeg grew, the community were very small and isolated. So cloves and nutmeg could be monopolized, but not pepper or cinnamon. Um, so then Jane Peterson Cohen, he was very clear in his head that in order to, um, you know, bring maximum profit for the company and for the Dutch Republic, at that time it was a Republic, uh, you need to monopolize uh, the sources of um, cloves and nutmeg maize. Um, because if you have competition like the English, then the prices that they would have to pay would be higher. Uh, and then uh, the price would be lower in Europe because there would be more than one seller. So he was determined to achieve a total monopoly. And this is what he achieved, you know, through his, by his action, by his strategy and what he put in place. Uh, and that kind of enriched, you know, uh, the Dutch Republic for a long time after he was already dead. Now he arrived in the Banda Islands with three, about 3,000 personnel. Uh, at his under his command, some who were already there, you know, in that part of the world, um, in, uh, you know, who were who Dutch uh, who were there previously, um, and and stationed there. Look, and he brought uh, more than two thousand with him, and so total he had more than three thousand under his control. Now he organized an invasion of uh, Banda Basari, you know, the big island, on 11th, 7th of March. And by 11th of March, uh, they had conquered the island. Now, it wasn't easy because the island defense was very strong and the Bandanis were good fighters, you know. Um, uh, but then, like many other stories around the world, uh, they were betrayed, you know, by some of their own people for money. So the Dutch managed to uh, bribe, you know, some of the local Bandanis to help them uh, to um, um, find ways, you know, uh, into the island and into different places and and show them how to get from one place to another. Um, so that's how the Dutch finally managed to capture uh, the the island. Now, um, what happened was that uh, then obviously the Orangkai, the leader, they were very afraid, and you know they saw the power of the Dutch, and a lot of the Bandanese people, you know, who left the villages, you know, which the Dutch uh, took over. They went to the mountains and in the hills, you know, with uh, forested hills, and they tried to kind of survive there and organize counter um, attack, you know, against the Dutch, which they did uh, for a while. And but the leaders came to the uh, Dutch, uh, you know, to Peterson Cohen, and um, uh, you know, tried to win his um, kind of sympathy and 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 support and bring in present and so on. But what the, um, what the Dutch commander did, he got them to sign even more harsher agreement. And one of them was to recognize the Dutch sovereignty of the Bandas. Um, and 
what some of the commentators have said is that he did it on purpose because uh, if you sign a contract and accept that sovereignty, and then if you break the contract, then you are actually committing treason and that can punish you for death. So what happened according to how the story has been told is that um, you know, after the Dutch took over the big island on the Basar, uh, they stationed troops in a particular village and they took over people's houses and a mosque and a place where you know, the locals uh, used to come and, and sit and, and uh, congregate and discuss. And one evening while uh, the commander was sleeping, a lamp of the mosque or whatever fell on the floor and made a big noise and that created a panic. Um, and so that led to, um, you know, created a lot of panic and, you know, and, and so on. And that led to um, Jan Peterson Cohen um, accusing the leaders of uh, the Banda uh, Basara. Yeah? So the leaders that were kind of uh, with him, um, and who gave, gave themselves into him. Um, accused them of uh, planning insurrection, um, you know, while pretending to be uh, friendly. Um, there were other things that Dutch uh, reported, which I don't want to go into. <coughs> um, and then, um, then obviously the 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 local, the leader, they uh, they um, they denied that they were engaged in organizing insurrection and rebellion. Um, but then they were tortured according to how the story has been told. And through torture, Jen Peterson Cohen got confession from them. And then they were ordered uh, to be executed. Just uh, this picture a little bit. This is um, one of the you know uh, nutmeg gardens you know in uh, Bandabasar when I went to visit. The big tree that you can see that's not a nutmeg. Nutmeg tree is a smaller tree. The big tree is called canary. It also produces very tasty nuts, and this kind of gives uh, shade you know to the nutmeg tree. Nutmeg tree is supposed to uh, you know perform better if they have some kind of shade. And when I was there. Um, I saw old Dutch coins, you know, people still collect uh, from the gardens. Um, and one guy showed me some old coins. Um, this is the last slide. Um, so basically uh, there was a Dutch lieutenant, you know, who uh, witnessed um, the, how the, um, the leaders were killed. Um, and he wrote, uh, he wrote his uh, account of what he witnessed. I'll just read this quickly and then I will say a few more words and I will finish my presentation. Um, what he said is that the 44 prisoners, one had committed suicide, were brought within the castle. That's Castle Nas Nasso. Eight foremost Orankaya, those who it was said, bell the cat, being kept apart, the other being herded together like sheep. A round enclosure was built of bamboo just outside the castle and into it were brought the prisoners, well bound with cord and surrounded by guards. Their sentence was read out to them for having conspired against the life of the here general and having broken the terms of the peace. Before the reading of the sentence, it was forbidden on pain of death for anyone else to enter the enclosure except only fathers and mothers. The condemned victim brought back within the enclosure Six Japanese soldiers were also ordered inside and with their sharp words, swords, they beheaded and quartered the eight chief Orankaya and then beheaded and quartered the 36 others. This execution was awful to see. The Orankaya died silently without uttering any sound except that one of them speaking Dutch tongue said, sirs, have you then no mercy? But indeed nothing availed. All that happened was so dreadful as to leave us stunned. The heads and quarters of those who had been executed were impaled upon bamboos and so displayed. This did it happen. God knows who is right. 
All of us professing Christians were filled with dismay at the way this affair was brought to a conclusion, and we took no pleasure in such dealings. Now, what happened soon after that? Um, the Dutch, you know, rounded up uh, a lot of people from the Banda Islands, uh, especially family members of those killed, and then shipped them to Jakarta and sold as slaves. Um, and there was there were many, you know, uh, ships that sailed with slaves from uh, Banda to other places. The idea behind this was to depopulate the island because uh, these people were um, kind of not willing to serve uh, the Dutch and the, uh, they, from the Dutch point of view, they betrayed the agreements uh, that they made um, several times in the past. So they thought they could bring in new uh, people um, into those islands um, and then grow and control and have total monopoly of the nutmeg. Um, in the process, what they also did, by the way, a lot of uh, people who escaped and who went to the mountains, they were starved to death because, uh, you know, they were blockade, no food was going to them. And so people died in many different ways. But I haven't seen any account which actually gives a good table of the way different, uh, you know, people from different islands of Panda died in what circumstances how many were directly killed, how many died of starvation, and how many died en route, you know, being transported as slaves and so on. So that work I haven't seen um, yet, you know, it might be there, but I haven't I have been able to see. But I have read where, where, you know, people give account or people suggest how the Bandanis uh, were kind of finally, um, you know, the genocide, how it, it took place. The idea behind, you know, that Jen Peterson Cohen had was to depopulate and bring in, you know, Dutch, uh, um, um, Dutch people uh, to own or control pieces of land uh, who were called park, parkeneers, you know, and the lands were called like plots, parkins, um, you know, to be, uh, to be, you know, uh, responsible for, um, and then, they would only sell the nutmeg to the Dutch East India Company. And the Dutch East India Company would supply them with slaves and contract workers to work in the nutmeg gardens, and then also provide them with you know, rice and other food essentials that they would need. Um, so this was uh, the plan, and this is exactly what happened. And that's how the story of uh, slaves from the Indian subcontinent comes into being. Uh, so as I was saying earlier on, Slaves from uh, both Bengal and South India were transported to Jakarta first, which the Dutch called Batavia, and then they were transported to other places. Um, many of the writers, you know, the, the, who wrote on this, uh, although none of them have directly stated the Bengali slaves were taken to the Bandas, but then they sort of imply that this is what happened because that's when a lot of slaves were needed very quickly. And that's when the shipment of Bengali slaves also started. Um, just another thing, you know, uh, when you look at this, um, what happened to the Bandas, and today, Bandanese people are a mixture of uh, people that the Dutch brought to the island, you know, from uh, many places, including some from the Indian subcontinent. And um, there's a possibility that some of the, uh, you know, uh, some of the mixes also included uh, from Bengal. Uh, but the current day Bandanese people, they're very, very aware uh, of what happened, you know, to, to, to their island, to the original people who lived there. And some of the original people were said to have escaped, you know, uh, and built new life in a nearby island called Kai Island, much bigger island. And, and I have, um, I've read, you know, various articles and pieces where they mention about, uh, the Bandanese, original Bandanese language actually survives in another island, you know, through the descendants of the people who escaped and made a life uh, in, 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 in some of the other islands. About genocide, you know, when you think um, how, how somebody can want to kill or, you know, deport a population um, a, a, of a unique people, uh, it's really, uh, uh, you know, I, I can't imagine. But if you if you think about it, 
in those days, if you look at the Caribbean islands, right, hundreds of islands were completely uh, genocided, you know, um, and brought in slaves and, 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 you know, wealthy settlers, you know, to make a life, make a lot of money and send back to the mother country. Um, so in the Caribbean islands, like one, right, hundreds of islands, the original people are completely gone. Um, so, and, and Bandanese people, you know, I'm really happy that Bandanese people try to remember this uh, and try and build a kind of strength, you know, from, from what happened and, and, and learn lesson, keep this memory alive. Um, it's also very important for us from all over the world because, uh, you know, people still are, in, are tempted or they think or something in some people makes them want to kill and destroy some other people. And some genocides, slow motion genocides are, are happening you know, in, around the world. This particular genocide was a fast, quick uh, planned genocide, you know, what happened in Banda. The Caribbean genocide and total destruction of the indigenous population happened uh, in most cases, as far as I believe, uh, can slowly, you know, in some places it might have been quick like this one. Um, if you take countries like Hawaii and Tahiti, there was also a genocide. The local population had been decimated and new people uh, were brought in to live. Um, to me, this is kind of awful. I will, I will end here and then we can have a discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmadullah, for that. Um, currently, there's no questions um, in the chat. Um, so, uh, you can. Someone's just. So, if there's any questions, here we go. We've got one message. Um, I mean, how can we make this history known wider? I mean, I only know about this because of attending your events, and it's not common knowledge? Well, I think, um, you know, um, what's happening now, I think, is there's a greater awareness, you know, taking place, <clears throat> especially in this country and around the world about the importance and the need to know history. Because if we don't know history, we really don't know uh, and understand the world, you know, as we experience it kind of now. So that's why it's really important. In terms of how we can get to know, it's um, obviously somebody don't know anything about it and they might not develop an interest like this very quickly. Um, so it takes a process. It's like uh, the efforts that I'm making, uh, hopefully will um, lead to many more people wanting to understand this history. Um, and, and another related issue, because once you go into one, then other things come up which you didn't know. Um, so it's, and also making connections, right, uh, with uh, people from uh, different parts of the world. Um, I know that, um, you know, people in the Banda Islands and a and lot of uh, academics and um, um, museum curators, you know, in, in the Netherlands uh, and some in America have been, um, been, you know, doing things, you know, to commemorate this um, and, and, and you know, researching and 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 you know, producing materials so that people don't kind of forget and understand how and why things happen. Thank you. Uh, We've got a couple of questions coming through. Um, the first one is: Is the presentation going to be available? Um, I'm assuming online. And the second question, well, actually, there's three questions. Um, who did the Dutch bring in to replace the decimated population? What happened, what I understand is that, um, uh, I will just give one example first. The first uh, people that the Dutch brought in large number was from an island, I think it's called Sioux, Sioux Island or something, I don't know how to pronounce it. It was an island that they captured from the Portu uh, Spanish near Philippines. And um, when the Dutch left, um, they actually kidnapped all, them, all the people from there, you know, brought them to the Banda because they didn't want the Spanish come back. You know, when the Spanish came back, when the, after Dutch uh, leaving the island, for the Spanish to have manpower, you know, to help them. So they put them to work in, in, the, in Bandanera, you know, the first island that they conquered. And then later on, some of them, they put them to work in 
eye, pull out eye, the island eye. But they were not really able to work on uh, the nutmeg because they don't know the fruit. They don't know the spice. They don't know how to care and cater for uh, the needs of the spice and, and the tree. Um, so see over the year, and what have also happened, some of these, some of the Bandanese people, the Dutch sold their slaves, took them to Jakarta and other places. They had to bring them back to teach the new people that they were bringing in how to, you know, uh, run, how to, how to look after the nutmeg plants and how to process the fruit, you know, uh, what, when is the best time, you know, to, to bring the fruit down and how you process them. Um, so over the years, right, they brought uh, a lot of slaves, you know, from India, South India and Bengal. Um, and then uh, from other places in Indonesia, also present-day Indonesia. Thank you. Um, um, we've got quite a few questions in the chat, so I'll probably read out two and then come back to you again. Um, were, um, the second question from Sonia is, were there attempts to grow spices on other islands? And um, from ZTJ, the rivalry between Dutch and English also played out in South Africa. The Banda Island history explains why English were so vicious, oh, that's a common, were so vicious with the Dutch there. It's from Gillian, do Dutch holiday in Banda and our, our school children in Netherlands taught this history? So, um, so, so I guess um, other spices in other islands, um, spices in other islands and is the Dutch taught that in school, their own history? Well, you know, um, the most expensive spices in, in Europe those days were cloves and uh, nutmeg, right? Now, nutmeg only grew in Banda Archipelago, nowhere else. And cloves grew in a slightly bigger area, right? Um, in North Maluku, especially the main center was uh, the island of Ternate and Tidore. And there are several other islands and also in Ambon. Um, but uh, pepper, pepper grew in, you know, like Sumatra in, in big, large areas. Um, so, um, uh, but it, it, so the locals is to protect the nutmeg so that it doesn't go <clears throat> to other places, you know, to grow. Mm -hmm. And during the Dutch also, they also had a very strict policy so that uh, the nutmeg plants cannot be smuggled, you know, to grow in another place. The but what happened? Play. But what happened when the English uh, invaded the Bandas, you know, later on, mm -hmm. during the Napoleonic War, in order to prevent an uh, you know, the France taking control of the uh, Netherlands territories, you know, Dutch territories in, in, in the Indies. So they invaded Banda and they, for the first time, they took thousands and thousands of nutmeg seedlings, you know, from, uh, from the Banda Islands, it was early 1800. And then they planted nutmeg, you know, in, uh, uh, in, um, in Grenada, you know, in the uh, West Indies, in, uh, uh, What's the place called in Malaysia? I forgot the name now, the famous island. Um, and, and various other places, so the English and Kerala, you know, in India. Uh, so uh, from early 1800, uh, nutmeg started to be grown in other places through uh, English taking the seedlings out and trying to grow to other places. So it didn't need a specific climate. It was, it was it, you could be grown elsewhere. Uh, well, um, I, I don't know the scientifics of, uh, you know, stuff. But some people used to say, you know, the unique uh, soil and the environment mm -hmm. uh, made uh, banda nutmeg um, kind of unique. But when you take it to other places, you might lose some of those uh, unique, uh, you know, banda flavor, right? I'm sure. not expert on this, but people say this. And the second question is, do, do Dutch holiday in banda and our school children in Netherlands talk this history? Well, you know, when I was in banda, I uh, went to some school and school children are aware, you know, and they also ask me a question, why did the Europeans come so far away to our islands, right? I guess it's, this question is the other way around, is, is yeah. the Dutch taught this? Well, you know, I don't know uh, how much uh, it is taught in, in, in the Netherlands, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, recently um, there have been, um, as far as I know, I don't know what level it was before, right? But I see some interest, you know, in in dealing with this history. Uh, we had a presentation from a Dutch academic a couple of years ago. I went to visit, and he told us how, for a long time, they were really not taught or allowed or encouraged to learn about the Dutch history in Indonesia. But things are kind of changing. 
And you know, another reason why I went to the island, uh, Banda Island, was because um, a couple of years ago, I got in touch with some curators, you know, in, uh, in Netherlands uh, from Rijk Museum. And they told me about um, an exhibition that they were working on for, uh, to, which was going to be launched uh, last September, actually, September 2020, uh, Indian Ocean Slavery, Dutch Indian Ocean Slavery. And Bengali slavery, story of Bengali slavery was going to be a prominent feature of the exhibition. They also contacted me to um, ask for some information or links or suggestion about uh, Bengali ballads and music, you know, things like that that they want to include. But I don't know what happened. I think the pandemic has kind of uh, derailed it, uh, the plan. So I don't know when um, they have planned to kind of uh, reschedule. Um, so I think there are efforts making, but then something depressing also happened. Um, I don't remember exactly when, I think about 10 years ago or so, is um, in the town, uh, I think called Hoon, where Jen um, Peterson Cohen was born. Um, they actually erected a statue of him by celebrating the biggest hero, you know, who brought so much riches to the, the uh, you know, the Netherlands, the Dutch Republic. Um, you know, and he was the one who massacred and killed all, all those people and depopulated. The other thing they also did, you know, uh, because Rune and I was a bit far, you know, from the, um, the main administrative island and the Bandabasa, the main island where they grew a lot of nutmeg. So they decided to uproot, you know, and destroy all the nutmeg plants from there uh, because they wanted to also, um, um, like control the quantity produced in order to get the best price. Mm -hmm. um, so this happened for a long time. So I have seen reports, you know, in um, maybe middle of 1600, where some people talked about how, you know, uh, like uh, desert-like, you know, the islands have become, which were previously um, in, had a lot of uh, nutmeg plants. Yep, it serves their interest to become a monopoly. Um, okay, we've got two, um, I think three more questions. Um, how much do the local people know about their ancestor being Bengali? Um, is nutmeg a major export of Bandas? And was Peterson a general? That's it. So three part, three questions. Okay. In terms of <laughs> Bengali, right? I mean, even I don't know if there are any Bengali blood, you know, right? In the, uh, I'm not certain, right? Yeah. Uh, among the mixed race of uh, present day Bandanese people. But I suspect there must be some, right? Because for more than 40 years, right? Uh, Bengali slaves were taken, uh, both men and women, and also infant children. Uh, a lot of people died en route as well, and while they were there as well. And the other thing, you know, the, the Bengal, the land, a lot of rivers and a lot of fish, you know, river fish. And Banda is, there's no river there, you know, and you have a um, very dry kind of uh, a place, you know. Uh, water around a lot of you know like sea so you could swim and catch fish from there but the land was very different you know from uh, from bengal so i don't know how these slaves uh, there would have kind of well they had no choice anyway they would get bitten and 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 punished if they didn't work you know so they had to work all the time um so i think i'm i'm, I'm not sh and local people there's no awareness that um, um you know, Bengali slaves were taken, uh, if they were taken, you know, to. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I'm hoping to do is, uh, you know, the lady in the book, she she names uh, particular ships, the first ship and the last ships which took, and how many Bengali slaves that they took from Arakan. So when the ships arrived in Jakarta, there must be some records of how those uh, slaves from India, uh, Palikat, you know, South India and Bengal were distributed, you know, this dispersed mm -hmm. um, there should be some kind of trace somewhere you know where we can find you know how many slaves of bengali origin ended up in the Banda. Uh, so this for someone maybe with the intention to an interesting phd you know <laughs> can undertake right but they would also need to know um you know both uh, indonesian language and dutch language uh, that has been a problem for me because i couldn't really access a lot of the Dutch materials, you know, firsthand. Um, so there's an English kind of bias perspective in what I've been reading. Mm -hmm. um, 
so is is nutmeg a major export of Banda currently? Yeah, it is. It is right. It's grown. It is probably the um, the biggest export, you know, of uh, because it grows everywhere. I've been to uh, several Dutch, sorry, uh, nutmeg um, nutmeg plantation. Um, I've also seen a lot of, um, not a lot. I've seen some um, houses, you know, the, where the Dutch parkeneers used to live. Parkeneers are like planters mm -hmm. uh, who used to live, and very big houses, walled, very lavish, you know. Um, decoration and marbles and everything that they used to order uh, to be brought from uh, Europe and so on. So they lived a nice opulent life. Um, and yeah, so, uh, so but but as I was saying local, there's a lot of uh, awareness now about look, the, the connection with America because the, I just want to point this out, the uh, island rune, you know, which was under the control of the English for nearly four years. And because English managed to get signed agreement from the, from the um, local leaders, right? And they had physical possession of the island or presence of the, in the island. They never gave out their, their sort of claim to the island. Um, and uh, uh, and um, so they continued, you know, to assert, you know, to, and few Englishmen did end up there, ship end up there to try and reclaim the island, you know, from the Dutch. And there were also at one time, some English people were prepared, you know, a group of colonists to go and, and establish colony, you know, reoccupy Banda, you know, many years after the Dutch took over. But obviously it was not feasible. The, <clears throat> the Dutch were too strong in that part of the world. Um, but then um, in 1667, um, by that time, the English managed to capture um, an island the Dutch used to control um, in a place in, in which is in New York. Um, and through official kind of peace negotiation, they decided to formally um, in a swap um, the um, island of Manhattan, which the English took from the Dutch and island of Rune, you know, which the Dutch took from the English. Um, so, uh, you know, now the contract, at that time, Island of Rune was, you know, a million times more expensive uh, real estate you know, in terms of value than Manhattan Island, but now it's kind of completely uh, reversed, right? Yeah? Island of Rune is nothing compared to New York and Manhattan. So this contrast, this history is, um, everybody knows in Banda, you know, they talk about it. Uh, and there has been like uh, joint projects, you know, between some New Yorkers and some Bandanese, some Indonesian to, to bring that links, you know, to bring their contrast, to bring the history to light and, and build, build relationship, you know, to, um, and there's Thank been you. artists, yeah, sorry. Thank you, that's really, that's really interesting to connect to New York and, 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 and the, uh, the island of Rune. Um, so the other question is, was Peterson a general? So I guess his, his, his rank. He was, um, uh, he was, um, he was, so i tell you something about Peterson first, right? You know, at a very young age, he was a very like, um, very strict kind of person. And I think when he was about 12 or 13, his parents sent him to Rome, you know, uh, to study uh, bookkeeping, accountancy, with one of uh, uh, their relatives who was uh, doing business there. So in Rome, um, you know, Peterson learned about bookkeeping about money, about profit, you know, about expenses. And that learning actually is what was behind a lot of his uh, calculations and how you make profit in the Bandas. So he was a bookkeeper, you know, he was like an accountant. But then he signed up with the Dutch East India Company. And um, he, he, was, he, he, he played a variety of roles. But in 1618, he was made the governor general of the Dutch East Indies. He was only 31, I think, at that time, if I remember correctly. And he was the youngest, you know. And he was he had like a very clear strategic vision. And and he he was determined, you know, he was a determined character. Um, you know, and and he used to make efforts, you know, uh, ruthless efforts to achieve what he wanted to achieve. Uh, so he was the um, hang on, which one this? He was the fifth governor general of the Dutch East Indies. And everything began to kind of change 
um, when he became the um, governor general in 1618 in terms of uh, moving towards an end game for total Dutch control of the, you know, what we know as Indonesia today. Thank you, Father. Um, this is um, uh, in reference to Bengali ancestry. Um, has there or could there be a DNA study on the Bandar Island? I think I think uh, I'm, I'm I'm not sure if somebody has undertaken, but um, you know now people are doing DNA tests just, just to see where the their mixes have come from. Um, during a previous conversation, when I attended a Zoom session. Um, in an in internet around table, I did mention, and one of the curators, right, she, um, in the chat, she said, um, you know, there are records, you know, in the 17th century of, uh, you know, a certain percentage of um, the, you know, the Bandanese population were from the Indian subcontinent, right? Um, so I'm sure DNA will, will be able to show more accurately, you know, the current makeup of the Bandanese people and their origin. Hold on a moment. Just was on mute there for a moment. Um, okay. Uh, oh, sorry, I've just lost all the questions. Um, um, when did the island swap happen, I guess, with Rune and Manhattan? This was in uh, 1667, right? It was called, uh, under, a, under a treaty called Treaty of Breda, right? When um, <clears throat> Uh, this official swap took place. So um, in terms of just um, your next steps, so we haven't got any more questions. What, what, you're, what are you planning to do? What I'm hoping to do is, um, I'm actually developing a project, right? I'm hoping to run a project called Spice Wars, you know, where people, um, you know, can participate in, uh, in writing fiction, historical fiction to do with, uh, the English East India Company's uh, kind of participation in the spice war. I mean, this will not only involve, you know, um, the Banda Islands or what happened in Indonesia, because during that period, there's all these other connections, you know, <clears throat> linked to um, these, the competition for spices, uh, because uh, the, you know, they needed Indian textiles, you know, to swap for spices in Indonesia and so on. So, and then they were passing, uh, staying in South Africa, you know, en route for re replenishment. And the first East India Company conflict uh, death, you know, took place in the uh, island of uh, Pemba, you know, which is near Africa. Uh, and so there's so many interesting, um, you know, subject areas that people could explore through fiction. Mm -hmm. So this is what I'm hoping to develop. But I'm personally uh, working at the moment to write a short fiction historical fiction based on the insight that I have gained about, uh, you know, the story of Banda and, and the story of Bengali slavery. So I'm just uh, thinking of how I'm going to bring, bring that together, right? And I'm hoping to um, develop a play on that uh, by next year's anniversary of the Banda massacre, you know? I was hoping to do it this year, but pandemic kind of uh, um, threw everything out of, uh, how do you say this? Derail, derail, derail my plan. So I've got a left field question for you from me. Say if the colonial powers didn't take place, where do you think Banda Island would be now? Um, well, if, if European colonialism didn't take place, but there might have been other kind of colonialism, you know, because people are always trying to build empires. Um, technically, you know, Banda Island was um, some kind of uh, under, uh, under kind of... Um, how do you say this? Um, I think the Banda Islanders, they had some kind of, uh, they, um, you know, the, the Sultan of Ternate, he was a small island, but he had very, he was very powerful. He controlled a lot of territories and the people and the Banda Islanders also technically kind of uh, gave allegiance to him, right? So even, you know, when the Dutch were trying to control the Banda Islanders, because Dutch had already conquered, you know, uh, kind of controlled the Ternate Island and the Sultan, um, you know, was under the influence. The, so the Dutch managed to get the Sultan to write a letter uh, informing 
telling the islanders in Banda to accept the Dutch um, kind of dominance, you know, and follow and, and not challenge the Dutch and, and so on, something like that. So uh, it's really difficult to tell, you know, uh, if Western European colonialism didn't happen, what would have happened? Uh, but I guess uh, personally, um, you know, um, because they've lived like that for a long time and there would have been, um, you know, population mixing going on, you know, through trade um, and, and, and just movement of people. So the community would have continued to evolve uh, naturally, you know, with, through natural kind of mixing and, and so on. Uh, but I don't think there would have been a complete change of population genocide. Um, who knows? We've got um, another question. Did the Dutch try to impose Protestantism, to Protestantism, I'm pronouncing this wrong, I'm sorry, on the islanders? No, no, Dutch, Dutch did not try to uh, proselyte, you know, they didn't try to promote uh, Christianity in, uh, in, but the Portuguese were different, you know, when the Portuguese were in the, in those parts of Indonesia, uh, they, they tried to, um, um, you know, convert people into Christianity. But the Dutch and the English didn't do that, right? Um, this is one of the reasons why maybe, you know, um, um, you know, nearly, there's a small Christian community in Banda Island, but overwhelmingly Muslim. Okay, we don't seem to have any more questions. So I don't know if you want to expand on anything um, that you didn't have enough time for. Or... I'd just like to say thank you very much yeah. you know, for uh, uh, for joining this session. Um, I'm still trying to get used to making presentation on Zoom. Uh, I hope I did a good job. <laughs> and, uh, and I hope you will take uh, more interest, you know, in learning about this particular um, history. Uh, it's a really, really, you know, when man's greed, you know, um, for a small fruit, right? Yeah? Um, that can, you know, lead you to kill uh, thousands of people and bring in slaves. Uh, and then your country, you know, Amsterdam and the Netherlands uh, becoming enriched from profits made from uh, uh, this, this small fruit, uh, this small spice. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's how, you, how you stop people, you know, from using greed to destroy people for, for benefits of one group of people at the expense of another group of people. So I think history is very important for us to learn so that we can avoid, you know, and empower small or weaker communities so that they can defend themselves. Thank you for giving us a very riveting talk. It's very informative. Um, again, everybody on the comments is saying thank you so much for doing the research because it is um, quite a lot of resources you need to look at, to read. And like you said, there's, there's multiple languages to also contest with. So thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. What I'll be doing, I'll be sending everybody later on an email with... Uh, Feedback, you know, if you got any feedback, uh, I'd be really happy, happy to hear and, and any information, additional information that people might have, if we, they might want to share. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Um, well, thank you so much. And um, this will be available on Facebook, your talk, won't it? That's right. I'm, it, I, I put on recording, if this, if he has recorded properly, <laughs> then I will put it on YouTube and, and share it with everyone who has signed, who has signed up, you know. Um, well, and then just to say to everybody, thank you for coming and um, do feedback when you receive the email and goodbye, I guess. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye. Hello, thank Mr. Thank you. Uh, Hello? Muhammad Ahmed. Hello. Yes. Sorry. Uh, nice to see you in here and thanks for helping us. And could you share your YouTube uh, channel also with us? Yes. Uh, sorry. Who are you? I can't see you. Where are you from? <laughs> Zamin Ali. Hello, Mr. Zamin. 
I mean, where are you uh, from? I'm, uh, my name is Zamin Ali. I'm from Afghanistan. But uh, since 2013, I have been living in Indonesia. Oh. All right. OK. What I will do, um, have we got your email? I will put it on YouTube um, in the next couple of days, and then I can share it with you. If you send me your email. Um, I actually, I'm Gita Patel. I'm actually talking from the US. And mm -hmm. I sent you my email. I'd love to um, see it. I mean, I'd love to have a copy of the um, the talk because it's it's an excellent talk to teach with. I had a meeting this morning, so I couldn't come earlier. Mm -hmm. But um, it would be wonderful. Ahmadullah, could you perhaps just pop your email into the chat? And um, I, just... Okay. I... And that way, if anybody doesn't have your email and have just joined through Facebook or something, um, perhaps they at least have your email to contact you on. That's right. And also, Mr. Uh, Gita Patel, I will, I will, I will communicate with you. Yeah. I think your email. I've got your email, haven't I? I did. I sent you my email. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that would be lovely, actually, because I've been doing um, work on the area, um, mm -hmm. late eighteenth century. Mm -hmm. um, but also working with other people who sort of do some of the history. But I think it's the your lecture is really useful for undergrads, you know, and, and young people um, to listen to. So I'd love to be able to share it as well. <laughs>